April 18, 1943, Worcestershire, England. Four young boys are out and about for the day when one of them climbs into a hollow tree looking for a bird's nest and eggs. But what they found was a skull and a female skeleton. All these years later, authorities still don't know who she is. This is a case full of mystery, war spies, witchcraft, and even cabaret singers. This is the 81-year-old case of Who Put Bella in the Witch Elm. Hey, y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. back everybody yes welcome 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 and for our friends in greece and cyprus Ooh, let's go i want to go <laughs> carlos iltate carlos iltate carlos iltate very nice and i have no idea if i pronounced that correctly because <laughs> i couldn't find any pronunciations on it but i want to give those guys a shout out well i thought it was perfect how's that <laughs> okay cool <laughs> Nepotism in work, right there. It was <laughs> there perfect, go. honey. It was great. Yeah. Hey, my wife said it was perfect. There you go. <laughs> well, wherever you're listening, be sure to hit that subscribe button, then like, rate, and review the podcast so other people who love true crime just like you can find us. And if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. You can find us on Instagram at Hitch to Homicide or on X at H2H underscore podcast. And if you want true crime every single day of the week, these people are the best. They Please are. go join our closed Facebook group, The In-Laws and Outlaws. Just yep. go to Facebook, type in H2H In-Laws and Outlaws, answer a couple questions, and you're in. Go join. Yes, please. I post lots of photos, other information in there. It's a great group of folks. We really, really love them. Yes. We also now have a Buy Me a Coffee link if you want to send Rob some coffee. He drinks it every episode. You I can do. find that link in our show notes. I do. And this week... We had Jocelyn Villalobos, who goes by Joy. She bought three coffees, but there was a stipulation in her note. Yeah, she what said, is that, honey? <laughs> she, Joy added in the note, buy Chris a Mountain Dew. <laughs> there, you go. there it is, Joy. <laughs> there it is, sister. Mm -hmm. So there you go, jo <laughs> Joy. Thank you so much. <laughs> we appreciate it, Joy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Bye, Chris. That's Mountain Dew. Somebody's <laughs> thinking of me. Love it. You can also send us a text. The link to that is at the top of the show notes. It says, send Chris and Rob a text. I have a couple to share with you today. Uh oh. This one's from Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh. Hello from North Carolina. I just want to let you know that I listen to you all the time, and both of you keep me so entertained. Nice. Are you not entertained? <laughs> I'm on a roll today. It's the Mountain Dew. Let me get my drum out. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to you at night, but I may need to listen to you when I'm at work. I work at a skilled nursing home, and I work in the business office, and I must say you two keep a smile on my face and keep me entertained. I just want to say thank you. Okay. Sending much love. From the Tar Heel State of North Carolina. There you go. I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina for 14 years, so I'm very familiar with it. And, uh, yeah, I'm originally from Ohio, so, yeah, I'm Big Ten. So I had to live in the ACC area and take all the abuse for 14 years. He's okay. <laughs> but I survived. He survived it. I got family from Asheville, North Carolina. That's where my mom grew up. Yeah. So, you know what? I love North Carolina yeah. and UNC, except... When we play them in basketball. There you go. This one's from Williamstown, Kentucky. Hey! <laughs> Lots of whys in that one. My name is Linda, but I go by Nani. Oh. I love your podcast, and you guys are amazing. And we're all from Kentucky. Have a great day, guys. Thanks, Nani. <laughs> 
And the last one from Jefferson City, Missouri. I would love to hear you all do a show on the murder of the Kansas moms, Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. Mm. Love your show. Thank you. Oh, nice. So thanks for that. And yeah. we do have a form you can go fill out, but I did put it on the list. Yeah. Send us a note, please. <laughs> well, I have a funny little story for you because, you know, you always get the fun stuff <laughs> and I get the heavy stuff. <laughs> you do all the heavy lifting. I do. Well, I do all the heavy stories. <laughs> you do all the heavy lifting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I have a funny little story for you today. Mm-hmm. A burglar breaks into a home and he holds the husband and wife hostage and he forces the two to sit in chairs. He ties them up and this burglar slowly and methodically, he starts robbing the house okay. and the burglars taking just about everything. He's ready to leave and the homeowners are still like tied up to their chairs. And suddenly the man yells to the burglar, please untie her, let her go. And he's like, no, I'm not untying either of you. I got to get away. I got to get as far away before the authorities get here. Okay. And um, he says, listen, don't worry. Your your neighbors aren't going to wonder why your lights are, are still on throughout the night and check on you. And the man says, again, please just, just untie her. I'll do anything. Okay. And the criminal's like, seriously, I, I got to get away. I got to get away. And the guy goes, please, I'm begging you for the last time. Just let her go. She won't call the cops. I promise. And this guy's crying by now. And the burglar is like, wow, he he really loves his wife. And he says, sir, you must really love your wife to beg me to untie her so desperately. And he said, not really. It's just that my wife's going to be home in 15 minutes. <laughs> Till death do us part, honey. <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, let me get my rim shot out. <laughs> All right. This case has so many interesting pieces and moving parts. Y'all, Rob's going to love it. It's set in the middle of World War II. There you go. I love it because it's an older case. It's 81 years old. It's a mystery, and she's a Jane Doe. Mm. And speaking of Jane Doe's... I released Jane Doe 4 yesterday, which is part of the Jane Doe books. And if you haven't started reading this series, go check it out. The first book, Jane Doe Scarlet, is free everywhere for your e-reader just to get you started. Nice. The difference between my Jane Doe and today's podcast Jane Doe is that the Jane Doe today is a victim and my Jane Doe is an assassin. (laughs) So she's badass. A little twisted, not going to lie. Yeah, I always say your Jane Doe is like a cross between Jack Reacher and Laura Croft. If they had a child, she would be Jane Doe. She's definitely badass. So go check it out. Yeah, it's a great series. (laughs) Well, are you ready for World War II? Let's bring it on. Before we get started, let me thank some sources. ABC Australia, the Birmingham Mail, Reddit, the IndependentNews.com, the MuseumAssociation.org, Stourbridge News, Atlas Obscura, History and Imagination, Curious Archive, Wikipedia, the Unexplained Mysteries Blog, Warfare History Network, the WoodlandTrust.org, and EvilFandom.com. All right. Well, you ready? I am. Let's do it. It's April 1943. World War II is in year four. It's a Sunday, April 18th. In Worcestershire, England. And I looked it up. (laughs) (laughs) It's not Worcestershire. It's not Worcestershire. (laughs) It's Worcestershire. Okay. This is a place where they can trace the history of the area back to the 6th century It's located in the West Midlands, just south of Birmingham. And among other things, it's home to the world's oldest continually published newspaper. Oh, really? It's called Barrow's Journal, which was established in, you want to take a guess? No idea. 1690. Gee whiz. How about that? Wow. Well, I'm glad that this place is notarized by that, because every time I hear that name, I want a steak. (laughs) Of course you do. (laughs) In Worcestershire is an area known as Hagley, and in July of 1764, Sir Richard Littleton erected a 70-foot obelisk on the summit of Witchberry Hill in Hagley. It's visible for miles around. Mm. 
Fast forward 179 years, and England is in the middle of World War II. And on April 18, 1943, four teenage boys are in Hagley Wood, which is a part of the estate along with Hagley Hill, which belongs to the Viscount Cobham near Witchberry Hill. What is that? That's a who is that? Who is that? The Viscount <laughs> Cobham. He's part of the Lyttelton family. Viscount. Yeah, he's okay. a Viscount. Okay. I don't know what a Viscount is. Well, you're not watching Bridgerton then. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Everybody knows what a Viscount is. I don't know. I, I got to get him involved in some some fur, some history further back than World War II and World War I. My best guess is that that could be cured with penicillin. <laughs> I mean, I have no idea. No, it's a high-ranking royal title. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm with you now. The Viscount Cobham. Okay. And he owns this property that's near Witchberry Hill. And he's part of the Lyttelton family. And today, the 12th Viscount still lives there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And when these four boys are out, like, walking around, they happen upon an ancient witch elm. It's also sometimes called a Scots elm. Okay. But a Britannica from 1822 says that it was also referred to as the witch hazel. That was the only place I saw that. Mm. But elm trees used to be linked with melancholy and death. And this is thought to be because the trees can drop dead branches without warning. Mm. And elm wood was also used for coffins. Oh, wow. And in folk tales, the elm tree holds the power to give you prophetic dreams. Really? And a witch elm can reportedly live for 400 years and grow up to 100 feet in height. Wow. And the witch elm is a little bit easier to work with as a wood for carpentry than the common elm because it will actually split. And it has been used in decorative turning and to make boat parts, furniture, wheel hubs, wooden water pipes. Wooden water pipes. Seriously? (laughs) Okay. Floorboards, storage chests, or witches and coffins, which has led it to be associated with death and burial grounds. All right. The witch elm has been nearly wiped out by something called the Dutch elm disease. Yeah. And the name witch, it's W-Y-C-H, comes from the Old English word weiss, which means supple. Oh, And now that you know all about the witch elm, that's your dendrology lesson for the day. (laughs) I feel very enlightened. There was a particular witch elm on the Viscount Cobham's estate in Hagley Woods that was interesting because it was hollow in the center. And on April 18th, 1943, four boys are what they're doing what's called bird nesting. Hmm. They're stealing eggs. Robert Hart, Thomas Willits. Bob Farmer and Fred Payne are out looking for eggs in the Hagley Woods. They're actually trespassing on Viscount Cobham's property. They see this huge witch elm, and because it's hollow on the inside, they're thinking it's probably got a bird's nest inside. Right, of course. Now, first off, these four boys are alone in the middle of World War II looking for eggs. And they're really close to an area called Birmingham. And the Birmingham Blitz has been going on. This is the Nazis heavily bombing this area using the German Luftwaffe. Right. And they bombed this area only the second after London. London was the one that was bombed the most. After that was Birmingham. Right. And it's because it's a manufacturing location. And around 1942, tons of bombs were dropped on Birmingham, making it the third most heavily bombed city in England. And it's 37 miles north of Worcestershire. And that's where these kids are out on their own. Well, I was going to bring up the fact that they're out there roaming around in 1943. Yeah. Just for that very reason. I'm like, guys. Yeah. So I'm really setting this scene for you. By the way, the Birmingham Blitz ended on April 23rd, 1943, five days after these boys are out on their own. Jeez. That's just coincidence. But they're out there in the middle of it. Yep. 
So these four boys happened upon this witch elm tree. I read that the tree, quote, had a collection of mist forming at the bottom, end mm. quote. So as if the thought of being bombed or captured by Nazis wasn't enough, they're in this wooded area without permission, and it's creepy as hell, okay? <laughs> Bob Farmer, who I read wasn't necessarily the bravest, but he was actually the skinniest. (laughs) They think Bob is skinny enough that he could shimmy in there and get any eggs. So Bob climbs in the tree and he looks inside and he thinks he sees an egg and he gets closer and then he thinks it's a dead animal. So he reaches in and pulls out a human skull. (laughs) Man. Then he sees that this human skull has hair and teeth, and he realizes he's found a dead body. Wow. And the eye sockets, one of the things this little boy talks about was that the eye sockets were empty. (laughs) And to make it even creepier, there's a patch of brown hair that's attached to this skull. Oh, man. Now, these four boys, what do you think they do? Well, I know what I would have done. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> My butt would have been out of there real quick. They freak out. <laughs> Number one, they found a human skull, yeah. so they should probably tell someone. But they're on the Viscount Cobham's property illegally poaching eggs. Mm-hmm. So they put the skull back. <laughs> it's like, put the candle back. Yeah. <laughs> They put the skull back in the hollow witch elm, and they get the heck fire out of the woods, and they make a pact that they would never tell anyone about the woman in the witch elm. Wow. It feels very Stephen King's The Body, yeah. which is the what the movie Stand By Me is based on. You know, the boy's out yeah. in the woods, and they find the body. Yep. But that night... The youngest of the four boys, Thomas Willits, he had to tell the truth. (laughs) He couldn't hold it in. He had to tell the truth. So he tells his parents. He tells his dad. He tells his dad this whole story. And his dad was like, yeah, I I don't know, son. (laughs) Seems a little far-fetched to me. But he did tell the Worcestershire police, and they agree to go check it out. In the morning (laughs) when it's light outside. Right. Because who wants to go to some dark woods in the middle of the night to search for a head inside a tree or wake the Viscount and tell him you're on his property looking for a dead body? Right. Right? Yep. So when police arrive the next day, they discover that it's not just a skull. It's almost a complete skeleton of a woman stuffed down into the hollow of this tree. Wow. Now, police have no idea who she is. The body was sent for forensic examination by the Birmingham-based home office pathologist. His name is James Webster. He quickly said that it was a female who'd been dead for at least 18 months, placing the time of death in or before October 1941. Okay. And Webster also discovered a section of taffeta stuffed in her mouth which suggested that she had died from suffocation. Hmm. Now, from the measurement of the trunk in which the body had been discovered, he also deduced that it must have been placed there. The body had to have been placed there when it was, quote, still warm, end quote, Hmm. after the murder, as it wouldn't have fit in there once rigor mortis had taken hold. Makes sense. Now, they believe she was about five feet tall, brown hair. She was wearing a dark blue striped wool cardigan with a light blue belt, a skirt with peach colored taffeta. So that's where the taffeta came from underneath the skirt. And she was wearing blue crepe soled shoes. They believe she was probably a mom. They think she had maybe had a child. And from the skull, they could see that she had crooked teeth and her two front teeth in particular overlapped. Now, there were no signs of disease or natural death to the body, but the taffeta from her skirt, again, in her mouth, they think "Mm, she probably suffocated. Right. Now, police contacted every dentist in the country, hoping to identify the victim by her distinctive teeth. They also painstakingly eliminated all the missing persons from the area. So after eliminating the people they knew were missing and giving out information to the public, 
the police felt confident that somebody's going to come forward to confirm this woman's identity. Right. But they're in the middle of World War II, and there were lots of men and women who were missing. Right. Soldiers, children, civilians, they all went missing. You want to guess how many Americans are still missing from World War II? Uh, I can't even imagine. According to figures from the U.S. Department of Defense, POW, MIA's accounting agency, more than 80,000 World War II soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have never been found or fully accounted for. 80,000. Man, it's amazing. It's crazy. Yep. Now, when no one came forward with any information, the skeletal remains became a Jane Doe. And there was only one further clue. This local businessman had filed a report in July of 1941. He'd been walking home through Hagley Green. He was skirting the border of the woods, and he heard a woman's desperate screams. Mm. And a couple of minutes later, he ran into a local school teacher who had also heard the screams and was, quote, perturbed, in quote, by them. It's like, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Sorry I bothered you while yeah, I was Yeah, sorry being I'm murdered. bothering you with my screams <laughs> while I'm being murdered and stuffed into a witch elm. Oh, man. But together, the two people, these two men, they call the police who arrive promptly. They search the woods. They find nothing. And this happened 20 months before the woman's body was found and estimated to have been dead some 18 months. So it kind of tracks, right? Sure. Because the pathologist, James Webster, said that Jane Doe had been dead 18 months. Right. So take that for what you will. And if they searched the area and her body had been stuffed down into that hollow tree, why would they find her? Right. Because this little boy had to climb up there. Right. Then around Christmas 1943, just a few months after Jane Doe is found in the Witch Elm, when the case is cold and they're about to hang up their investigation, a message is found on Hayden Hill Road in Old Hill, England, which read, Who Put Lula Bella Down the Witch Elm? Oh. It was written in chalk on the side of a house. And shortly after, another message was found on a wall on Upper Dean Street in Birmingham that read, Who put Bella down the witch elm? Hagley Wood? Question mark. So somebody's teasing. Yeah. Yeah. The messages were written so high up on the walls, they couldn't have been done by children. Right. So the messages were taken seriously by all the adults and the, and the authorities. And over the following months, more messages appeared, all written in the same hand. Hmm. And they'd condensed their message to, who put Bella in the witch elm? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> So now police are thinking that somebody knows something right. or more than they're letting on. And they search for who's writing this graffiti. And like I said, it was too high for it to be kids. Sure. So they start asking everybody, do you know somebody named Bella? Who's Bella? And the rumor mill started to crank up and people were saying she was a sacrifice Bella, this body, was a sacrifice related to black magic. Oh, wow. Why? <laughs> well, I said she was almost a complete skeleton. Right. Her right hand was missing. Ooh. And they would find her hand bones, quote, 13 paces away from the tree, end quote. Wow. Which brings us to one of the many theories about this Jane Doe, the hand of glory. Hmm. Professor and anthropologist Margaret Murray had a theory. She believed that the woman was a victim of a cult sacrifice because her hand had been severed and that was connected to black magic and the hand of glory. Okay. So a hand of glory is the dried, get this, is the dried and pickled hand of a hanged man or woman, I suppose, often specified as being the left hand or the sinister hand, or if the person was hanged for murder, the hand that, quote, did the deed, end quote. Which is exactly why I don't like pickles. <laughs> <laughs> there are pictures of this. I will post them in the in-laws and outlaws. Wow. 
Old European beliefs attribute great powers to a hand of glory combined with a candle made from fat of the corpse of the same person. <laughs> this seems like a lot of trouble. <laughs> that they took the hand from. <laughs> Gee whiz. Quote, it must be cut from the body of a criminal on the on the gibbet, the gallows. Yeah. Pickled in salt and the urine of man, woman, dog, horse, and mare. Smoked with herbs and hay for a month. I'm not done. (laughs) Hung on an oak tree for three nights. Running. Then laid at a crossroads. Then hung on a church door for one night while the maker keeps watch on the porch. And if that be no fear hath driven you forth from the porch, (laughs) then the hand be true one. And it is yours. End quote. (laughs) This is ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Well, a candle's made from the body fat of the person, right? (laughs) I said that. And then this candle is placed in the hand of glory, the dead person. The dead hand serves as a candlestick. And you light it. And the wick is made from the hair of the dead person. And the candle will only light for the holder. And the hand of glory was supposed to have the power to render all persons to whom it was presented motionless. So you're like, freeze. <laughs> you can't go anywhere. Well, I'm pretty sure if somebody handed that to me, I'd freeze too. <laughs> <laughs> it also had the power to unlock any door it came across. So you get up to a locked door, you get out your hand of glory with the candle made from somebody's human body fat and the wick of somebody's hair, the same person's hair, and you light it and then the door opens. I just want to know, did any door open with this thing? I don't know. I guess if you're a witch and you put that intention behind it, who knows? I don't know. Oh, man. But this is the theory that Margaret Murray put forward. By the way, there is a real hand of glory on display at the Whitby Museum in North Yorkshire. Okay. I'll show you a picture of it. (laughs) Nice. So was this woman, this Bella, was she a witch? Ancient folklore told of a tradition where a witch's corpse was imprisoned inside a tree to prevent her spirit causing havoc or seeking revenge. Mm. Now, the press loved this. They loved that there was this witch theory because the body of a local man, Charles Walton, was also found in the nearby village of Lower Quinton. He was pinned to the ground with a pitchfork. On Valentine's Day, 1945. Happy Valentine's Day. Charles Walton was a local 74-year-old man who was brutally murdered while he's just out doing his farming work. And while he's doing some groundskeeping, he was slashed and stabbed with his own scythe Mm. across the throat. Oh. And as he lay on the grass bleeding out, that was when he was pinned to the ground through the throat with his own pitchfork. Wow. Now, circumstantial evidence pointed towards his employer, Fred Potter, as being the killer. Walton was said to have loaned Potter a bunch of money that he couldn't afford to repay. But other people put the blame on Italian prisoners of war. And the Italians, having surrendered to the Allies in September of 1943, these POWs were just walking freely around town back then. Mm. So they're saying it was his partner. Then they're saying, no, it was... POWs. The POWs. Yeah, yeah. In 1954, local papers reported on another similar killing. This murder in the town of Long Compton, 15 miles from Lower Quinton. Now, they're reporting on it in the 50s, but the murder happened back in 1875. And the victim was an octogenarian named Anne Tennant, whose neighbors said she was a witch. <laughs> and she, too, was killed ritualistically in this case by being pinned to the ground with pitchforks. Anne's killer was a man named James Haywood. You know, he was a simple-minded guy. They thought he was just the village idiot. He was tried for murder, but he spent the rest of his life in an asylum. But he's the guy who said that she was a witch. And he claimed that he was a witch hunter (laughs) and would kill more witches if you ever let him out. (laughs) So they lock him up and throw away the key. (laughs) As they should have. But there's this whole history of witches and witch hunters and Satanists who'd lived in this area Mm -hmm. for like the past 70, 80 to 100 years, or if you go all the way back to the the first one, uh, hundreds of years. Okay. 
Then there's the Una Mossop theory. And this is about her husband, Jack, and his friend, Van Ralt. Jack Mossop was an engineer employed making plane parts in a Banner Lane factory during the war. Jack's a heavy drinker. He comes from a family of heavy drinkers. They were known to the locals as the, quote, seven sods, end quote, Wow! for their rowdy behavior. I'm not so sure that I would want somebody that's a heavy drinker making plane parts in World War II. <laughs> well, he was. Doesn't seem like a good combination. He was. Okay. all right. Uh, Jack wasn't brought up by his dad, but by the parents of the seven sods. All these brothers were the seven sods. His mom died of the Spanish flu when he was six years old. Wasn't that a Broadway musical? (laughs) The seven sods? The brothers of, yeah. It could be. Never mind. But he's brought up by his grandparents. And Jack's a smart kid. He often suffered from headaches and nightmares. And as the war progressed, he grew increasingly distant from his wife, Una. Okay. At 1 a.m. one morning, it's either believed to have happened in March or April of 1941, Jack returned home to his wife, Una. He's in a terrible state. He's with his drinking buddy, a Dutchman that Una only knew as Van Ralt. And Una suspected that Van Ralt was a spy because the man never worked, but he always had lots of money. Mm. And it's since been suggested he was actually a local rogue making his money by selling rationed goods on the black market because it's the middle of World War II. Sure. On the night in question, both men came home drunk but terribly shaken by an incident which may have haunted Jack for the rest of his life. Hmm. After he settles his nerves with another drink, Jack tells his wife Una that they had been drinking at the Lyttelton Arms, which is not far from Hagley Wood, with a woman he only referred to as that, quote, Dutch peace, end quote. Okay. So is that where, like, piece of ass comes from? I guess. A Dutch peace. Wow. At some point in the night, Van Ralt and the Dutch peace possibly got into an altercation. They get in a fight. Jack says that she got awkward, and the three left the pub together. Now, why do you leave the pub with somebody that you think is, quote, awkward? Yeah, and he's telling his wife this whole thing? Well, he's drunk, and they've come home. They're both there together. Wow. They piled into Van Ralt's rover, Jack in the driver's seat, Van Ralt, and the Dutch piece in the back. (laughs) Something never properly explained happened in the back seat, okay? Uh, Don't know what that was. Let me guess. (laughs) And the woman passed out, slumping towards Jack. And Van Ralt ordered Jack to drive toward the woods. And the two men got out of the rover. They carried this unconscious woman to a hollowed-out oak tree in Hagley Wood. The two men placed her inside the tree. Now, this is the story that Una gives to the police... In 1953, 10 years after this body's been found. Okay. And she does this because Una's long been separated from Jack at this point, Mm -hmm. and Jack's dead. So, you know, I guess she feels safe to come forward. Sure. I mean, he'd been an even heavier drinker after that night, according to her, and his headaches and nightmares just got worse. He worked less and less, but if anything, his cash flow seemed to increase. Hmm. And Una was convinced that her husband, Jack, also was a spy. Really? He became increasingly emotionally distant, violent, and moody. And while Jack may well have been seeing other women before the incident with the Dutch piece, (laughs) he was now increasingly turning to other women of the night for comfort. And a fed-up Una had had enough, and she left him. Got it. Now, this tale was kept under wraps to the public, but it was leaked to the newspapers by a whistleblower in 1958. Okay. And that leaker, Anna of Claverly, was actually Una. Mm. Now, these articles told of a Nazi spy ring in the Midlands who were out to infiltrate the many arms factories that were dotted along the region. And Bella, the body, according to this telling, was a Nazi spy Ah. and an occultist known as Clara Bella. Ah, 
Okay. Now, I'm going to stop for a second. Rob, who was into the occult during World War II? Oh, Hitler. Hitler. He was fanatical about it. Exactly. Yeah. They're saying that Clarabella parachuted in earlier in 1941 under the direction of a Nazi intelligence service known as the Abwehr, which translates from German to English as defense. Abwehr. Okay. The Abwehr records released post-war said a woman codenamed Clara parachuted into the West Midlands, but after she failed to make contact, they presumed She was killed in action. Clara was far from the only Nazi spy who parachuted into the United Kingdom. 17 spies were caught entering the UK in 1941 alone. Wow. Which brings us to a man named Josef Jacobs. (laughs) Josef Jacobs was 43 years old when he was captured in January of 1943. He was born in Luxembourg. He fought for Germany in the First World War. And when World War II broke out, he was called up to fight, serving as an officer, until the Nazis discovered he'd spent four years in jail in Switzerland between the wars for selling imitation gold as real. Okay. Yeah, so surprisingly, Nazi Germany felt this made him unfit to lead men into battle. They're Nazis. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not like they have uh, very many scruples. Right, right. Yeah. But he's selling fake gold, so he can't lead our men. Yeah. Whatever. But it didn't make him ineligible to become a spy. (laughs) On January 31st, Jacobs parachuted into Ramsey, Huntingdonshire, in the east of England. He landed. He had a bad landing. Lands badly. He breaks his ankle. He's arrested the following day. He's hobbling along in his flying suit, and he was carrying 500 pounds, $500, a counterfeit ID, a radio transmitter, and a photograph of a woman and a German sausage. Because I guess you never know where your next meal's coming from in the middle of World War II. He's parachuting in with the German sausage in his pocket. Well, I have to say, I mean, I've been to Germany, and uh, <laughs> and those German sausages are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to hold that against him. And, of course, my first thought is, is that a German sausage in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> So, Yakov is actually caught after he fires his pistol into the air like a flare gun mm-hmm. because the pain of his broken ankle was just too much for him, <laughs> too much for him to bear. Yeah. And the home guard arrested him and handed him over to MI5. Okay. Now, Yosef gave a voluntary statement to MI5, which included the explanation of everything he's carrying around with him, maybe not the sausage, but he explains this photograph that he has on him. It's a photograph of a woman. This woman is not his wife. The woman in the picture is his lover, a German cabaret singer, an actress named Clara Bowerly. Okay. Clara was also a spy and, according to Jacobs, was due to jump somewhere over the West Midlands. She knew people there. And Bowerly was a cabaret singer in the West Midlands clubs in the 1930s. Mm Mm-hmm. Jacobs was court-martialed as an enemy combatant and executed by a firing squad on August 15th, 1941. He was the last man to be executed at the Tower of London. Hmm, Interesting. So is the mystery solved? Is Bella Clara? Because Bella was a German cabaret singer and actress who was allegedly into the occult. She had occult leanings. Mm -hmm. And she parachuted in to sabotage weapons factories. Gotcha. Had she, for some unexplained unexplained reason, fallen out with her compatriots, who then killed her and then stuffed her in this tree? And for decades, this was advanced as the most likely scenario. That's what people thought. Okay, we finally figured it out. Right. It's Clara. Right. But this theory fell apart in 2015. Hmm. 2015. Okay. First, Clara was six feet tall. Do you remember how tall I said The corpse was? Yeah, it was like five five feet tall. Yeah. Second, her death certificate was unearthed in Germany in 2015, and Clara died on the 16th of December, 1942, in a Berlin hospital Mm. from barbiturate poisoning. Okay. So it can't be her. 
And now you would think with all the advances that we have in DNA and genetic genealogy, Mm -hmm. we could find a killer based on the DNA from a relative still living that we could possibly get from somewhere and find out who Bella really was. Bella's remains went missing at an undisclosed point between her discovery and the advent of DNA testing. Really? Yeah. Somebody doesn't want uh, anyone to know who this person is. She is gone. Wow. And currently there is only one lead. Bella's skull was photographed and those photos do still exist. Okay. And in 2018, Caroline Richardson, an artist who specializes in creating facial reconstructions of the long deceased, Mm -hmm. created a portrait of Bella. Oh, Now, police were hoping that somebody's going to be looking through old family photos and would see a face and be like, oh, my gosh, that's Aunt Sally. That's 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 the same person that's in this picture. Yeah. But as of yet, nobody has. Wow. (laughs) And it seems that Bella is to have no rest. Her spirit is said to haunt a nearby pub called Badger's Set, which was once the Gypsy's Tent and is now called the Beefeater Grill. (laughs) (laughs) It is opposite Hagley Wood. The pub, when it was a pub, would suffer from cold spots, doors opening on their own, (laughs) and objects being mysteriously moved around the room. Wow. The owners and patrons have always referred to the ghost as Bella. And the community just hasn't forgotten about her because on August 18th, 1999, a 200 year old stone obelisk. Do you remember me talking about in the 1700s? They erected this obelisk that oh, could yeah. be seen for miles. Yeah, yeah. So on this 200 year old stone obelisk on Hagley Hill Estate, they found one morning covered in graffiti in tall white letters asking again. Who put Bella in the witch elm? No way. In the beginning, all who put Bella in the witch elms were in chalk. But this one is in paint and it is still there today. Wow. Because no one has ever come forward. They have never solved this case. It is considered cold. And this case remains open. (laughs) But that's the story of the Jane Doe found in a tree. Was she a spy? Was she a witch? Was she somebody's aunt who actually did put Bella in the witch elm? Wow. But that's all I have to say about that. For nearly seven years, Jane Doe has lived in the shadows, her past buried deep beneath layers of secrecy and silence. After completing more than was asked of her in her last assignment for the enigmatic Kai Wolf Project, Jane Doe vanished without a trace, leaving behind a trail of dead bodies and unanswered questions. But now, as the specter of her past returns with a vengeance, Jane finds herself thrust back into a world she thought she'd left behind forever. When her former sins come knocking on her door, Jane is faced with an impossible choice— continue to hide in the shadows or once again take up arms against the forces that threaten to tear apart the fabric of society. With enemies lurking around every corner and allies who may not be what they seem, Jane must rely on her wits, training, and her unyielding determination to survive. And while trust is a luxury she cannot afford, Jane must confront the truth about herself and her past. As the clock ticks, She realizes that the line between family, friend, and foe are razor thin. And in the end, the only person she can rely on is herself. Jane Doe 4, Charlotte is available September 24th, 2024. No name, no regrets, no mercy. You know, it doesn't surprise me that her identification has never been solidified because, I mean, when somebody becomes a spy, right? I mean, they literally erase everything about them and give them a new identity Yeah, that is obviously false, but uh, untraceable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like my Jane Doe. Every time she has a new assignment, she's a different person. She's a ghost. Yeah. And that's exactly what these spies were like. Right. Yeah. 
Well, she didn't have an ID, but these idiots do. So let's do a little <laughs> bless your heart. Well, bless your heart. All right, number one, I'm calling. This is your brain on drugs. Well, that is if you had a brain. Okay. All right. Douglas Peter Kelly, 49, of Hawthorne, told detectives from the Putnam County Sheriff's Office that he had a violent reaction after smoking methamphetamine he had purchased a week <laughs> earlier and wanted investigators to take a look at the product. Dude, take a look at this meth. <laughs> the suspect. It's hinky. This is hinky meth. <laughs> oh, my God. The suspect said he believed because of the violent reaction he had after smoking the drug, he was sold the wrong narcotic department officials posted on Facebook Wednesday. Rats. Yeah, Kelly told detectives in the drug unit he wanted the substance tested because he wanted to press charges on the person who sold him the wrong narcotic. Yeah. <laughs> detectives obliged Kelly's request, telling him to come on down to the sheriff's office. He then... This is just crazy. He then drove to the facility, handed investigators a clear crystal-like substance wrapped in aluminum foil that later tested for, well, you'll never guess, methamphetamine. Rats. Telling you, man. <laughs> Kelly was charged with possession of methamphetamine and was walked next door to the Putnam County Jail where he was ordered and held on a $5,000 bond, authorities said. <laughs> we'll be taking that and we'll be taking you over here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, number two. People, movies aren't real. No, they're not. Yeah. In 1996, Mission Impossible, Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise, makes his way through the air vents at a CIA to hack an impregnable computer. <laughs> First off, you're never going to make, make it through the air vents <laughs> at the CIA, but go for it. Yeah, well, here you go. Would-be burglar George Romero, or Jorge, tried to pull off the same trick at the Winner's Bar in Elmhurst, Queen. The only problem was that Romero got stuck in the vent and had to be rescued by firefighters who promptly passed him off to the waiting police. That, re that reminds me of like, have you ever seen the video of the little dog that tr or the big dog that tries to get through the little dog door and gets stuck? Yes. <laughs> it's time to put him on a diet. That's it. Exactly. It's time to put, what's his name again? Jorge? No. Yeah. What was it? It was either George or Jorge. Oh, it's time to put Jorge on <laughs> some Nutrisystem. Yeah, All exactly. right. All right. Number three. The zombies made me do it. Okay. <laughs> Patrick Ray, 31, was arrested early Thursday morning for burglarizing a home in Deltona, Florida, and allegedly stealing a number of belongings, including a pink selfie stick, wallet, and car keys. A pink selfie stick. Yeah, well, that was the important one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, according to the sheriff's office, Ray was caught on surveillance cameras taking a house key from a vehicle parked in the driveway to enter the house. Now, first of all, don't leave your keys, keys in, in the, the car. Keys in the ignition? Come yeah. On. Come yeah. on, people. Small towns. They, I mean, they used to do that in I small know. towns. The homeowner told deputies he woke up at 3 a.m. after hearing Ray going through his dresser drawers. So he must have been like in the same room with him. Can you imagine being asleep and you wake up? Somebody's like going through your sock drawer. Oh my God. I would at least ask him if you're going to take those out. Can you go ahead and throw them in the wash? For me? <laughs> no. Can you put them back yeah. in the organized manner that you found them? Yeah. He said Ray walked out of the home when he saw him, but then returned minutes later wearing a stolen coat. Ray allegedly told the owner that there were zombies trying to get him and he felt uncomfortable outside. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Leave the socks, take the coat. <laughs> That's it. The owner called the police and blocked Ray from leaving the home until they arrived. Ray, you're not going anywhere in my yeah. coat. Ray faces burglary charges and was booked in the county jail. He's being held on $17,000 bail. <sighs> those zombies, man, those will get you every single time. <laughs> they will. Every time. They always mess everything up. If it's not the witches, it's the zombie. Or the witch hunters, it's the zombie. It's true. Well, if you have a bless your heart or you know somebody's heart who needs blessing, all you got to do is go to Hitch to Homicide where there's a pull-down menu. And while you're there, you can also suggest a case. That's mm -hmm. the best way for me to get it on the list. But I do get all the others on there. Yep. But I would appreciate it if you yes. use the form. Please. While you're there, you can also tell us about your brush with true crime. That's my amazing World War II loving husband out there. <laughs> That's my beautiful bride in the booth. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. Bye, y'all.